and welcome to uh, this lecture that will be offered by uh, increasingly a friend of AUK, Mr. Blasin Jiha. Uh, I heard for the first time about Mr. Jiha when I was at your age. Uh, it was in the mid 90s, and it seems a long time ago. Uh, he is a relative of a former roommate of mine. And being like you today, full of energy, full of hope, and full of uh, ideas, as well as uh, thinking what we're going to do for the future, Mr. Gia was an inspiration for us. You know, a successful person who had moved abroad, who worked very hard, and he really established a company that was very successful. Recently, I met with Mr. Gia again after about uh, almost 20 years, and I wanted to introduce him into AOK because I compared myself with you guys today, and I thought it would be a very good idea that you hear from him directly. Because all of you are going to the best university that would like to believe it is in Kosovo, the UK. And we are really expecting and we are really trying to educate you to really be successful in life. But we only can do that in the classroom. We can give you lectures and great professors of course do their best to really prepare you for that. But hearing from somebody that has really lived that life, I think it is something that we cannot give you in the classroom. That's why uh, we, look for, we look forward to this day, and I hope you guys will take this opportunity to learn as much as you can. Mr. Gia will uh, give a presentation for about 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on how long it goes, or 35. And then afterwards, we will uh, start a conversation with Mr. Gia, where you will be having the opportunity to ask questions and uh, try to answer those questions you might have. And I hope you will have a lot of questions. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Gia, and let's enjoy this lecture. Thank you very much, Ilya, for inviting me to this lecture. It was a great pleasure for me to be here in front of students, future, maybe, hopefully, entrepreneurs in Kosovo. And I, uh, I'm pleased that there is, uh, I can't say a large audience, but a reasonable audience here today. And I hope I can contribute to your future career in some way. I chose the... <laughs> I chose the title for today's presentation from an idea to a growing enterprise because this is something that I've done. So I, I've gone through the process and this is something that now I'm trying to implement in Pristina and wider and in that manner to help all the young people that are interested in starting uh, their own career with their own business. Uh, some of you may start uh, a venture or a business uh, after you graduate. Uh, more of you will probably start a business after you've had a career in another company or other companies. But probably most of you will never have their own business. And uh, this lecture and myself here, I would like to encourage you to at least think about it and to uh, try to understand better what is the process of uh, starting a new business. And here I've written growing enterprise, which is actually not just a small little business that you can start, but it's more a serious uh, uh, enterprise which will grow in time and be sustainable. Okay, so let's move. If you want to have a business or a growing enterprise, uh, you must have a, a, a compelling, a, an important, outstanding business idea. Everything starts with the idea. Another important factor is the management team. So the owners of the idea uh, must be skilled, must be uh, persons that are, are professional, that are passionate, and they really want to uh, create something new and important. And the third, very important, sometimes the most important part, is the financing. Uh, you can't build a growing business without financing. It's, it's almost impossible. Uh, and you will see afterwards in the example of my company, I will show you all the phases of financing of that business and how much that was, and it's a, a fundamental factor. Okay? Now, 
what is a business idea? A successful company always starts with a powerful business idea. It's the first milestone in the process of founding a growing company. Now the characteristics of a promising business idea are, does the idea fulfill a customer need or does it solve a problem? This is fundamental. If you don't solve a problem, if you don't reply to a need, that idea does not have any sense from the business standpoint of view. Is that idea innovative? Is it unique? Does it, does it distinguish itself from other ideas, from other products or services that are in the market? Does the management team have a clear focus on that idea? And once that product, based on that idea, exists or that service exists, will that business be profitable in the long term? So no matter how brilliant an idea is, initially it has no commercial value, which is not very promising either. But that means that there's a lot of work from the idea to the, to the growth company. And innovative business, does, or innovative business ideas do not come from the sky. I don't think any of you, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but if we take a, a large number of people, uh, usually the idea doesn't come from the sky and here it is, I got it and now I will make a business. Uh, usually that's linked to a very hard work in the process. So it's not something that just comes from the sky. Yeah. So let's just look at these three important factors a little bit more close. Because everything starts from the market. The market, the customer, customer satisfaction, it's all about that at the beginning. So what is the customer benefit and does it solve a problem? The key to marketing success is not superb products, it's satisfied customers. This is something that many people don't understand. People think I've got a, an engineer, thinks he's got a great product, everybody will love it. If it doesn't fulfill a need, and if it doesn't solve a problem, it will remain just being a nice product, that's all, for the technicians and the engineers. So it must satisfy a customer's need. Customers buy products, services to satisfy a need or to solve a problem. And here we have a lot of examples, uh, in food and drinking, uh, uh, something that makes work easier. That could be some equipment that we innovate, okay, new technology, to make a process be cheaper, be uh, more productive, or to enhance well-being altogether. I want to live better, easier, so I have products which will help me do that. Or for self-esteem, people also buy products of luxury. You know, they have a standard, they have a position, and they want to be uh, fed well with good products. And that's also something that you do. So, actually, the whole industry is the market. But you have to find your target market. So the market, the business idea only has a then a commercial value when the market starts absorbing that product. Is there a potential market for my product? I have to test that. I have to know that. If, I, if I'm not sure about that, don't start a business. You can't start a business and say, well, let's hope it will happen. Hope is one thing. The market is something else. So if you don't have a potential market, and specifically a target market where your product can be uh, put in, then uh, you will have a problem. And then, of course, that's not enough. In that market, if you enter a market, usually there's a big, usually today, for new product, there's always competition. That competition may be big, may, might be small, but there will be certainly, unless it's something revolutionary. But revolutionary products and services are usually beyond a normal entrepreneur's reach. I mean, not every day is Apple uh, established or Microsoft and so on. So, uh, you know, we don't have to go with, with that illusion. We have to stay on the ground and try to be innovative with more low-tech than very high-tech products. High-tech is very risky. Low-tech is much more or less risky. And it's easier to achieve. So, uh, in that market, you will find the competition and you have to have a product that can differentiate. It has to be unique. It has to be better than the competition, otherwise you can't get into that market. You'll be 
killed at the very beginning and kicked out of the market. If everything is okay with the product and the market and so on, then uh, you have to be sure that that product or that service will bring money in the long term, revenue. If you don't do that, then there is no sense in having a company that loses money. You have to close it down. You're not creating anything. You're just using your resources, spending them, and not getting anything for it. It doesn't help anybody. So this is something very, very important. Uh, uh, how much you earn, and then how the money is earned. That is also very important, but we will talk about it a little bit later. Now, um, that was about the idea. The second factor, which today is becoming more and more important, and without this, companies cannot survive, is the management team. So, uh, the, the group of people, or those people that have the idea, the, the owners of the idea, are usually also the managers of the company that is established there. Now, besides the right business idea, the appropriate environment and support by different partners, it is compulsory to have the tireless driving force of the management team. If you don't have a passionate professional team, uh, the chances of survival are relatively small. Building a growing enterprise in a very laborious task is a very laborious task. Success is achieved step by step and with hard work. You can only then be successful if you have the best people. Now, if you have a good management team, a passionate, where every single uh, uh, member of the management group complements uh, themselves, in that case, usually those people also select the right people to work in the company. Okay? So, the people, that's probably the most important asset in the company. All right? So why is the team better than an individual? Multiple skills, complementary tasks, searching solutions together is easier than individually. Decision making is easier. It's much easier when you talk to your partners about a problem than if you think about it all, all, all by yourself. And then another very important thing, when you start to raise funds for your business, you talk to investors. And investors rely on teams and not on individuals. Because then it's very high risk if you depend only on one person. If you depend on a whole team, the risk is lower. All right. A venture, a new business, has an idea. It might have a product and may have sales and profit, and it certainly has costs. Anything that you start, you will start paying money first before earning it. So costs start from the first day. That's why a good entrepreneur has total control of his costs. So what a venture does not have is a business. When you start a business, it's not a business. Uh, it doesn't have a business. A viable operating organization in which people know where they are going, what they are supposed to do, and what the result should be. That's a strategy. So, uh, a, a startup needs to be organized, it needs a lot of work until you can say that it is a business. So, unless a new venture develops into a new business and makes sure of being managed, it will not survive no matter how brilliant the business idea is. Because after that brilliant idea for a product or a service, the resources, the human resources, the, 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 the financial resources have to be managed. You have to manage your time, you have to manage your cash flow, you have to manage your people. If you can't do that, you will not succeed, even with the best product. So entrepreneurial management in the new venture requires focus on the market, as we said before, financial foresight and especially planning for the cash flow, building a management team long before the venture needs one. And this is a little bit of parallel. And I'm starting a business and I'm spending a huge amount of money on the management. Because the managers, they have to live. They have families. If, if they're not too young, they have families. So they need to be paid. So if you have a good idea, you have a good business and so on, in this case, if you want to have a good management, then you probably need to have financial resources even before starting your company. Or you have uh, people that are starting the business that have their own money and they invest in it at the beginning. That's also possible. 
So from the investor's point of view, and this is, this is important, investors will not be satisfied just with the description of their idea, even if it's brilliant. Investors want to know precisely for what their money is being spent and especially with whom. The theme is just as important as the idea. Investors want to know from the very beginning when their involvement will end and how they will get their return on investment. So why does an investor go into the company? He goes first because he believes in it and he believes that the product or the service will be successful and the company will grow and will be profitable. After five years, that company would have a much higher value than the money that he has invested in that company. So he will get a much higher return if he exits. So the investors usually go in, shape up the company together with the management, make it grow, make it profitable, increase the price of the company, then sell it or sell their shares to the owners. And then he gets a much higher return. And then he can invest that money again in other companies or he can go around the world and travel and travel and travel. All right? So I invest in management, management, not in ideas. Uh, these are some quotes from investors. Teams are performing individuals, especially when performance requires multiple skills, judgments and experience. So it's all about actually management after we have the, the, the powerful idea. The third factor, financing of an enterprise. For every business, capital is indispensable. You can't, you can't build a good business and a growing enterprise without capital. It's impossible. During the life cycle of an enterprise, you should go uh, through different levels of types of financing. You will see afterwards there are in, in different stages of the development of a company, uh, how you finance it, how you can finance it, or, 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 or when you need the money. So, what are the financing sources? Friends and family. Usually, when you start a company, no bank, no uh, business angel, no uh, venture capital will give you any money. So, you either rely on yourself, on your family, or on your friends. When you're lucky, somebody will give you the money. But usually, this is it. So you have to start small at the beginning. There are resources like governmental and international grants, especially here we see that for usually micro businesses and small businesses. Bank loans, bank loans will be given only after a very thorough scrutinizing of the company, a very deep due diligence because uh, usually the banks never give loans for startups. They only give loans when a company already has customers, already has revenues and profits. And if they want to go to the next stage, then they can get money because they have a good proven track record. The banks otherwise will not do it, in principle, I'm talking, right? Now, there are others, like business angels, who, if they see that a company has a prospect to develop, to grow, to become a good company, it has a good product, it has a good service, then a business angel, after doing the due diligence, which is not like venture capitalists do or banks do, it's more uh, it's a routine, broadline due diligence. And if he understands that that company has a good future, profitable future, then he will invest. But usually a business angel also wants an equity from the company, which is usually a minority. So he might take 20% of the shares of the company for the nominal price, because at the beginning the company doesn't have value. Right? He gets, he gets in it. But then usually uh, um, the, the business angel helps the company by giving it a loan at very convenient uh, conditions. Bank hearing costs will give you uh, 10, 11, 12, 13% interest rate, which is unacceptable. I would never accept to build a business with that, with that uh, interest rate, and I would not <laughs> recommend it to you either especially if you need to guarantee with your house or your land or anything of the kind. Don't do it. Now, how do we, how do we overcome it? Uh, business angels can help in that they give um, a loan which is with much lower interest rates because his interest is to help the company <coughs> and not to make a bigger burden to a startup financially because that will that the company already in the start has a lot of expenses, more expenses than usually revenue. 
Maybe I'll maybe explain to them what who these business business angels are. Those I will I will come to that right but in a, in a minute, all right? I'm just giving you a, an idea, just uh, to make it a little bit more interesting and not just read it. So the business angel uh, will invest in the company. He will give you very good conditions, uh, of course, if the idea and the business is okay and, 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 and profitable in the long term. For instance, a business angel may give you a, a loan with an interest rate of 2 or 3 percent, which is fully acceptable. It's good. And then he will give you a grace period of maybe one or two years, which is even better. So the PL and the balance of the company will not be financially heavy because of the loan. And the company can continue to invest in its, in its development. <coughs> and then strive for sales and revenue as quickly as possible so that you can pay back the loan. So uh, this is the business angel. I will come to that again. And then venture capitalists are much tougher. They are much stricter. They are, if I want to have a minority, they want to have a uh, a majority of the shares, and they have to, want to have full control. And then we have IPO, which is an initial public offering. This is if a company got, uh, goes public. In Kosovo here, we don't have that. We have, you can have, we have in almost every country in Western Europe, but here we don't have that because of, understand, because of our history and so on, but that's, that's okay. But it will come, sooner or later it will come, and IPO is uh, something that, that you've already Heard many times, you've seen NASDAQ, you've seen the Swiss uh, stock exchange, uh, DAX of Germany, and so, so on. And that's where a company goes in, it's prepared, it makes the IPO initial uh, public offering. Uh, if the company is a high tech or, 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 a, or innovative company, uh, then it's, it's placed into the, uh, into the uh, market, into the uh, stock market. And that is the owners of the company float one part of the shares of that company into the public. And who are the public shareholders then? Usually bank institutions, uh, uh, pension funds, and so on. And then they become part of the company. And then the company, the, the, usually the, the, old, the earlier owners, founders of the company, uh, remain managers of the company, but now the shareholder structure has changed and the company becomes public. This is done also to attract a lot of capital into the company because the price, the evaluation of the company usually is high because it's a high tech company and then a lot of money goes into it. The owners get one part of the money for themselves, one part remains in the company and can be used to develop the company to the next stage. So IPO is interesting, but it's very, very tough. Okay. So what is the most appropriate financial source? That will really depend on many factors. It will depend on the development stage of the enterprise. Is it a startup or is it a seed company or is it a, in the seed stage or is it mature? It depends on the nature of the operation. Are we dealing with trade, with service, manufacturing? It depends on the technological level of the company. Is it low tech or high tech? Growth potential, low or high? Financial environment? Here we have a lot of problems, so we have to tackle this problem very, very seriously in order not to uh, make mistakes. And the best finance is all maybe the combination of these. So this, the entire startup process of an enterprise must be aimed on successful fundraising. Professional investors are the toughest test for the successful perspective of your entrepreneurial idea or business idea. Direct your communication entirely towards investors and learn to think as they do. So if you want to raise money from somebody, you have to explain to him in the best possible way what your product does, what are the benefits, who is the management team, are you guys skilled, do you have, uh, are you professionals, do you have experience, you don't have experience, and so on and so on. Okay. So, now to your question about business angels. Business angels are individuals who invest in companies with high growth potential. Now, who becomes a business angel? Usually, business angels are entrepreneurs with long experience who sell out their company or their shares in a company, earn money through that, 
and then they invested in new startups. Not just the money, but also their experience. And they do that at a relatively early stage of the company. All the other investment institutions do it at a later stage, when it's less risky. So a business angel takes higher risk. Right? And a business angel usually takes an equity, a minority equity, so 20-25% of the shares of the company, he buys it at the assessed, assessed price, which there are specialists who can assess the value of a company, and then he pays for that. And then in, the, in addition to that, he um, uh, uh, provides a loan to, to the company so that it can bridge the, the cash flow gaps in the time of the development of the future according to the business plan. And when, uh, usually the business agent receives also a position in the company, not necessarily an executive position, but at least a surveillance position, like a chairman of the board or at least a member of the board, so that he knows exactly what's going on in the company. He gives advice, recommendation, networking, all that is needed for a young company who does not have experience. Okay? Does that answer your question? Venture capitalists are much, they are institutional, they are not private. They are institutional uh, investors for uh, financing young enterprises with growth, with growth potential. So they are looking at very uh, um, uh, companies with the highest likelihood of success and growth. Usually also high tech, but also with uh, good potential. So above that, every, they get above average returns for that. Now, in order to be sure that the, the money that he puts into that company, that he gets a multiple of it back, uh, they scrutinize the company in all the detail. So there's nothing that, 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 that can be hidden. Right? They have professionals who do that. The VC requests ownership in the company, usually the majority, so that he can control. He can make the main decisions. They are very close to the management team, coaching, consulting, and so on, so that the management team can succeed and the company can succeed. And they aim profitable exit strategy. They either sell their shares back to the, to the owners of the company, the management, if they have the money, because the price will be very high at the exit stage, or they find a new strategic partner for the company who is prepared to pay a good price for the company, or they do the IPO, which has a very high return. Okay, so to, to wrap up the first part, uh, an entrepreneur creates something new, something different, he changes or transmutes values beyond being new and small. So we're not talking about small businesses, new businesses. To do that, an entrepreneur must innovate. Innovation is a specific instrument of an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur must be innovative if he wants to survive, if his company so, uh, needs to survive. Entrepreneurs always search for change, respond to it, and exploit it as an opportunity by taking calculated research. So, you know, in this world, you have change every day. In business, you have change every day. Every day there's news, good news and bad news, and you have to manage it, right? And if you can look at what's going to happen to your company uh, better than the others for the future, your chances of survival are much better. So you need to have a vision. You need to foresee risks and, and changes. Change and risks goes together. Entrepreneurship is risky mainly because so few of the so-called entrepreneurs know what they are doing. See? They lack methodology, they violate elementary and well-known rules. See? Uh, if you uh, are a real entrepreneur and you understand business, you, understand, you can see further ahead, you know what you're doing, you, you, you have the right people, you have the right resources and so on, the, the venture is risky, but very calculated risky. So uh, the probability that it will not work is relatively low. 
But if you don't work with rules, if you don't work with the right methodology, then uh, you will understand very early that something is wrong. And then it's usually too late and you've lost a lot of money. So entre entrepreneurship must be systematic. It needs to be managed and it must be based on purposeful innovation. Purposeful innovation means when you innovate, you have to have a purpose and that's usually uh, to, again, to respond to a need, to solve a problem. And uh, one of the gurus of management, entrepreneurship and uh, innovation is Peter Drucker. He, is, he, he uh, used to live in the States and he's written many, many books about uh, uh, entrepreneurship and, and innovation and management. And if you do want to know more about this, I would recommend you Peter Drucker. Right, that was the general part. Now I want to run you through a, a business case uh, very quickly about New Wave. The enterprise name is New Wave. So um, uh, New Wave is the company that I co-founded. I say co-founded because I, I founded the company together with a partner of mine, Filippo Marva. You will see that in a little bit later. And we, we gave the company the name New Wave. Uh, I started the company when I was 42. So uh, I was not very young at that, at that time. So there is not a, a specific age when to start a company. You can start it with 18, but you can start it with 68. I know a person who started his business with 68 years of age, and it was very successful, and it worked. So everything is possible. It depends on the idea, it depends on the passion, it depends on what you want to uh, achieve in life. So we used to work in a company that manufactured, designed and manufactured uninterruptible power supply systems. I don't know if this term is, uh, if you are aware of this term, uninterruptible power supply systems are, is the electronic equipment which continues to feed very sensitive equipment with power, even if there's a power cut or a power, dis uh, power disturbance. You, you call it, you, there are a lot of uh, inverters, we call it ups, ups, or inverters. They call it inverters here because uh, we have a lot of power cuts in it. So, now, the new wave market, when we started, was full of competition, big and small. UPS was nothing new, it was a very common product in the market. So, to get into that market as a newcomer, with no name, New Wave did not exist uh, before we established the company. Uh, that was, that was, you really needed to, to have something innovative and educate the market for the new product and its new features. And we gave the company the name New Wave for two reasons. This is their marketing. Communication is as important as everything else in your company. You need to communicate with your customers, you need to understand the needs, and you have to communicate in such a way that he understands that the product or service responds to his needs. If you don't do it correctly, you will not understand. Right? So new wave means a new wave. So we put the two letters together into a logo and change the color green, which is green, because our products were envi are environmentally friendly. So they're very efficient. They uh, save energy. We gave it a, an elliptic form around it to make it scientific. It's like an electron circling around the nucleus, right? And we are coming out with a new product that's bringing a new wave, a better wave than the competition, right? Because a, a UPS produces a sine wave, a perfect sine wave at the other, right? In culture, new wave means to break down old barriers. In music, you have new wave as well break down the old barriers and stuff or something. So the name was, it, it, it was very attractive. Yes. And when you start a new company, we need to have a slogan. Every fax that we sent at that time, we didn't have so much internet at that time, when we started in 1993, we used fax machines and so on. Every letter that we sent, we had the slogan, environmentally friendly power protection from UA. Power protection means to protect sensitive equipment from power failures, right? And, and environmentally, nobody talked at that time about energy, energy efficiency, and so on. We were the first ones. And that's where we really hit the nail 
with the hammer every day to, 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 to put that into people's heads. Okay? So what was the business idea? We had a new UPS technology with clear customer benefits. High efficiency. What does that mean for a customer? Energy saving is electrical bills went down. Smaller footprint. <coughs> UPS go usually into data centers to protect big servers, server farms, complete data center. And as they are small, they have a small footprint, you can save a lot of expensive data center uh, space. Because one square meter in a data center is extremely expensive. Right? So we did that saving. And then these UPS were lighter and more compact. So the logistic costs were lower because we ship all around the world. It was easier to maintain because we had a modular system which you can extract the module, uh, replace it, and then you go ahead. The management team was built with we we two persons, the Filippo Marpa and myself, the two co-founders. Filippo was the more the technical part, I was more the, the commercial part, although the idea of this new system was developed together because I'm also an engineer myself, but then I moved towards marketing and sales. But I had a lot of experience also in the electronic, uh, in the electronic world. Okay. So in the fifth, in the seed phase, we needed to test the business idea. So we we were convinced 100 percent that this new technology had clear customer benefits. Market surveys confirmed growth of the UPS demand for the coming decades, and the drivers of UPS demand today and yesterday and 20 years ago was deteriorated electrical networks. You know that the electrical networks deteriorate, the cables are cut, the, the airlines uh, uh, you, you, need to, you need to maintain, and it's very expensive, so people don't do it. They always shift the maintenance, and then they get cut, and then there's no power. So we need a UPS. And internet today, we live today in function of the internet. We can't do anything today almost without internet. And the internet has to be always online. All the data centers have to be online. You can't build any data center or any computer system today without a UPS. It's a norm, standard. So we had a guarantee that the market would grow. So the calculation of the risk for us too was we invested our proper money at the beginning. We didn't put any personal assets in. No house, no nothing. Never do that, right? In the worst case of a failure of the startup, we would lose that money that we invested at the beginning. It was okay, it was worth the risk, right? And uh, we were both very experienced engineers, so we had no problem with finding a job to feed our families. Right? But when we started the, the venture, we agreed that we will never give more than 50%, 49% uh, of the shares. So we always need to have together the majority of the shares so that we control the company. Regardless of all the investors. And second, every benefit that we get from the business, you wait, we share it 50 to 50. Independently of who deserves more or who deserves less. And that worked for 17 years. Right? So then we established the startup, but we we were we needed to design prototypes, we didn't have any infrastructure. Infrastructure for designing prototypes of this kind was very expensive. So we teamed up with a UPS manufacturer who actually is a competitor of us, or would be a competitor of us. But we did that so we could use his infrastructure and develop the products. So he came in with us, 40%, we have 30%, 30%. And we could use all this infrastructure to build the prototypes and we allowed him a license for manufacturing of our products. Let's go. So, you can see here a diagram of all the phases of the development of our company with the financing. So we went with personal savings in one bit, partnership with, a, a, with a Ematec, business angels, first bank loan, second bank loan, stock exchange, and then sales to ABB at the end. So we did almost all the possible financing uh, uh, possibilities that we had. Okay. 
and a few figures about new wave. New wave in 2010, before I uh, left, I left in 2011, had a revenue of approximately 80 million US uh, Swiss francs. The EBIT, the, so the profit before interest and taxes, was about 14%. So we earned almost a million francs a month profit. Not bad. We had 200 employees. Here you see 100, which worked in the plant in Switzerland, in Lugano, near Lugano. And 100 of the others worked in our nine subsidiaries that we had around Europe and in the world. And we have another 50 representatives, not our subsidiaries, but representatives. We had a plant of 11,000 premises. <coughs> Here you see just a small selected number of, of our customer. This, this was a part of our customer base. You can see we have uh, our UPSs in all the possible Swiss banks and German banks and uh, English banks like UK uh, okay, banks like Royal Bank of Scotland and Deutsche Bank and you get Credit Suisse and so on. Blue chip companies like Motorola and ABB and AEG and Hyundai and Rosenstock, whatever. So we were, we had very, very blue chip companies. And we didn't sell one UPS for this, we continually sold for this. And in many of these, we had systems of above one megavolt ampere. So they were very powerful systems in very big data centers. Okay. And here you can see the development curve how a development curve should look in a growth enterprise, a growing enterprise. So I, from the first year in 1994, that was our first fiscal year, to 2011, we had a continuous growth. To 2009. 2008, there was a crisis, financial bubble. And then uh, until it came to, to touch new wave, it took another six, to one year, six months to one year. And then we had a little dip there, you can see. But that dip was about 4%. The UPS market dipped 25%. We dipped only 4%, which means something. That we managed that change. We managed that problem very nicely. And even in that crisis, we took market share. Although we lost revenue, but we took market share. Why? Because the competition fell down much more than we did. So we took market share. And then there was a, a little correction in the coming years, and uh, the results in 2011 then went up a little bit more. Uh, but that, that was also a sign that this company had its limits as far as the market was concerned. We needed to invest a lot of money then to go abroad into other continents and sell more and, and go to the next stage. For that, we needed money, a lot of money, or sell the company. ABB came and offered us to buy 100% of the shares and then we sold out. Yeah. So now, I'm out of the company. I used to be 17 years the CEO, and the last two years I was the chairman of the company until we sold it to ABB. ABB has a fantastic world reach now for UPSs, and I'm sure that these numbers will triple in, in the coming years. Okay? This is the plant. It belongs to us. 11,000 square meters. It's in Partino. It's, it's in the Italian canton of Ticino, Switzerland. Uh, Swiss canton, Italian canton in, in Ticino. Right? And this is the product, one of the products. It's a modular UPS. You can see here the, the, the rack. In that rack, you can place six in this particular one, six UPSs. They work redundantly. So if one fails, the rest will continue to. to uh, uh, feed the load because it's, it's oversized, right? And then if you if you have a faulty module, uh, you can replace it without the need of interrupting the power to the to the load, which is fantastic because the mean time to repair goes down to 10 minutes, 15 minutes, as opposed to six hours for a normal UPS, and that increases the availability of the product, which is one of the strongest arguments that we have and strongest selling points. Okay. We used to participate regularly at CBIT as New Wave. We had a, always a very beautiful stand. Communication with customers is really important. Presence is important. Of course, we didn't do this from the first day. We had an 18 square meters stand the first time. But then we built it to 110 meters, which is this one. And this was 
in 2011. And uh, uh, we, we were so, we had such a good image in the market uh, that we could not, not participate at CBIT. CBIT is the biggest world IT and telecom show. It has about 100,000 visits a day in five days. So it's half a million people go to visit. Okay, two words about what I'm doing now, maybe of interest to you, if not today, tomorrow. So I've come to Pristina, Pristina, to, um, to now use my experience and to help new businesses and to encourage young entrepreneurs in Pristina, because I think you all agree with me, there's a lot of need for that in, in Pristina, and not only in Pristina. And uh, so, we established a company, I, which means encouraging young entrepreneurs. It's exactly what we want to do. In March this year, and until then, we, and until now, we have investigated the market to understand how, how the financing of businesses is here in Kosovo, so we know more or less. And our vision is to create economic and social value in the private sector of Kosovo. Because the private sector is the one that brings most jobs. And this is where everyone has to participate, not just the government. Of course, the government has to do a lot of work, but everybody, every individual has to do that. And how we do that, how we do that, is I, by encouraging young people and converting their outstanding idea into a growing business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I is going to organize a contest next year. I can't tell you exactly at which time we expect it to be January, February. So what are we going to do? We believe in the potential of good ideas in Kosovo, because there are a lot of young people here. We, we, we think that our people are as intelligent as anybody in America and the UK and everywhere. And we expect that everybody is going to be as creative as everybody else. So we just need to push the young people a little bit to be more, to have more courage and to really uh, be prepared to take a little bit of risk and to start a new business. So we will organize a contest in January and February where everybody who has a good potential idea, powerful idea, yes, business idea. So we're not going to build kiosks and a little uh, hamburger stands and so on. We want to be growing enterprise, right? And then we will select from that contest that will, you will register on the internet and that will last about two months or maybe three months. You will have time to make an executive summary of the, of, of the idea. And if your idea is compelling and, and as a good prospect to become a good business, we will then select that idea as one of the best ideas with a commission of professionals. This initiative is completely private. Right? And then we will, with those two or three or one company, we will go through the business planning process. Then we want to verify if that business idea really has a chance to survive as a business. And each of, that, of those groups of people, of, of, of managers or, or owners of the idea and future managers will have a coach which we will select and provide for that group and for that idea. And then we will go through the business plan process, which will last every one month. And then the commission will decide, does this business plan promise a good enterprise for the future, a good growing enterprise, or does it not? Maybe two of those companies will remain with a good prospect to become uh, a, a prospective businesses, growing businesses. Then uh, we will work with them and together with I and the management, we will then establish a company, one or two. Each company will then have a coach from I, or selected by I, to help the management build that company during four or five years. After four or five years, we will exit and we will leave the management to continue the path. We will launch it into the market completely, so we will leave them alone. And we will then go back to the process of, 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 of uh, recruiting new ideas and new businesses. And the money that we earn, we will earn money, we will not earn it but we will not put it in our pocket. That money is going to go into the fund to build new businesses. So it will be self-financing. And we hope that we will have, in the first run, at least one company, at 
we have one company in the first year, I think that's going to be a great success. Then we have a model. Once we have a model, then it's easier to multiply. And then it will be credible, and other people will come and help and build a fund. And then we have a chance to build more companies. Good companies. Okay. Thank you for enjoying <laughs> My very first question is, I believe everyone has this one, uh, what are the, the big barriers here in Kosovo that you see so far? Um, I think you are all aware of the, um, the work that the government still has to do to support uh, new initiatives, new startups to make their lives easier to establish companies. That's one of the problems. So, and I, I know that the government is working on it, but it, I think it will take a little bit of time, but we have to live with that. That, does, that can't be the hurdle for us. We have to fight against it, and we have to help the government uh, make things easier for us. If we don't do it, then it will take longer. If we participate in the improvement, then it will take less. Time. So uh, it's easy just to say it's, it's their fault and we can't do it, so we want to. Okay, so it needs a little bit of your initiative as well. And not only yours, everybody's. So that's one thing. Second thing is uh, there is there are a lot of organizations in Kosovo like CEED and uh, YEP and uh, others that give uh, grants, smaller grants for small and medium sized companies. And we have investigated that during our, uh, from March to now, and we've seen that those, those um, models are not the best models for growing companies and growing businesses, right? They are good to spread the, uh, the culture of entrepreneurship in Kosovo. Because uh, we don't have a very strong history of entrepreneurship in Kosovo because of historic reasons, right? And now we have to do a lot of homework to improve that and, and get back to a situation where our culture is more entrepreneurial than administrative, right? So uh, I think uh, all those organizations are here for the good purposes, for the good reasons, but I think a lot can be improved in their models. And this is one of the reasons why we are working with this kind of a model, because this model starts with the idea and ends with a growing company that we know precisely that it works. Right? So we have closed the cycle. And we invest in all of that. Nobody else invests. We do it. So the chances that it will succeed, we believe there are good ideas here. We believe that we can build managers as well to be good and we have the financial resources, so I don't see why we should not do it. Uh, we will have problems with the government a little bit, as we mentioned before, but those are little hurdles that we will certainly overcome. So the financing of companies is, is a problem. We don't have business angel structures here. We don't have business angel clubs in Kosovo. I don't, not that I know. Uh, there are no venture capitalists here. The banks, you can't rely on banks with 11, 12% of interest rates, it's, it's, it's prohibited. So, uh, uh, if you really have a good idea because of these problems, you have to be sure that it's a good idea. Right? And if you think that good idea can be converted into a good business, a growing business, then it's worth while sacrificing everything at the beginning that you can to make it happen. The but the, with exception of the house. We don't sell the house or sell the business. No house, no <laughs> land, nothing. Thank you. Right? Okay, we go here and then we go to Okay, thank you for the presentation. I'm Luisa Sikiroja, junior here in the UK. Uh, I want to know from your perspective that uh, what are some of the major struggles that a company I mean, in the beginning, has or 
go through until the phase of profit. But I've, <coughs> it's, it's, it's uh, you see, the, the answer to this question uh, is difficult. It's, it's not the same for every, every startup. Every startup has its specific difficulties. Okay, but I want to know in general. Sorry. Yes. I, I try to mention which are the important things, right? Now, of course, this is only one little part of it. If, if I were to explain what we've done in the 17 years and all the problems that we have, we need to answer or solve 20 problems a day. You know? of all different types, financial, managerial, customers, marketing, sales, everything. Yeah. So, you're faced with problems every day. The important thing is, the important thing is, and this is what you have to keep in mind, is that you have to be sure that you have a good idea. You have to be sure that you know what you're doing. You have to be sure that you know where you want to go, where you want to come, reach. That's the most important thing. And then you have to assess your skills and your, your, your team of people that are capable of doing it, that they're enough passionate, that they're hard workers, that they want to do it. Right? Because you want, you have to, if you want to do something, you really have to want to do it. Otherwise, you won't it. So, these are the, 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 the prerequisites. Money is extremely important, difficult to get. It's very difficult to get. But if you're convinced, if you're passionate, if you have the right product and the right service, and you're convinced that the market will absorb it, and you have the right people, there's always a solution for the money. You just have to find the right people also to help you or with their recommendations and consultancy. And there's something else I forgot to tell you, you need a little bit of luck as well. <laughs> I'm your boss, like Rosa, I'm a software here at AUK. Um, I want to relate to Fiola's question before for the barriers of business space. How how much do you see the lack of monetary policies here in Kosovo as a barrier to business startups or even at, at later phases? And another thing that I'm very interested in is these uh, startups, do you believe that the market here in Kosovo can uh, satisfy their, their, um, their potential? Or do you, do you consider at all maybe spreading to other uh, maybe regional countries or so, something like that? Let me answer your second question. Uh, when I say a growing company, su su uh, sustainably growing, growing company, so a company, if it, if it grows continuously, it's sustainable, it has a sustainable growth. And to be sustainable, you have to really have a good management and a management with an excellent strategy, right? Which may change with the changes in the environment, right? So, uh, you can only grow if you grow beyond the small country of ours. We have two million people here, not even two million. And if you have a growing company, you need to go outside of the borders. If you have a unique product, it can't be only unique for Kosovo. It has to be unique for the region and for Europe and quite wider. Okay? So you can have a product, let's take an example. A product which is sold in Slovenia, in Kosovo that product is never has never been sold because there was not a market and suddenly there is a market for that product and somebody sees that product over there, sees the need here and he either buys it or produces it himself. That's not innovation if it's the same as what, what the others are selling. It's, it's new for us but it's not innovative. It already exists. An, 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 an innovative product, a unique product is unique not only here but also beyond our borders. Right? So this, these companies, these growing companies, are meant for export, not just for us. Right? Now the first question, I don't know if I understood you correctly, you were talking about the monetary authorities of the government or the no. international or? Monetary policies. Yeah. Uh, because of the use of euro and we don't have a lot of leverage monetary policy no, or? We don't, we don't have, we don't have uh, tools to manage the inflation rate or stuff like um, interest rates of banks, which is something right. you mentioned before. Right. I mean, I see that as, again, it is a barrier to accessing uh, funds, but how, how much of, I mean, 
because we will not only be the entrepreneurs of this country, we will also be the leaders, so we will be at the other end as well. So how do you see the lack of monetary policies and do you think that is something we should focus on maybe establishing sooner rather than later? Uh, if you always wait for something to happen, you will never do it. Right? And the monitoring authorities, I only see that it's going in the right direction. But how fast, how quickly everything will work as it should to help young entrepreneurs quickly establish their companies, have all the rules in place and so on. Uh, I, I can't tell you that because I, I have no information about that. But also, we have a lack of information about the marketing also. For instance, I'm a co-owner of Rubove, right? And uh, we, in our board of directors, we always plan and, and, and make strategic decisions for the future, where we want to be in the next five years, or what to be doing, and so on and so on. And then we have to have a, 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 an idea about the market. If you don't have in so on, uh, a, um, a survey on the still water market at all. So we are investigating ourselves, trying to find it in different manners. Right? So that can't be impeding. I, I would say, well, I don't know how much the market will decide to stop. No. You have to go and try to find the solution for it. You have to find you have to do a survey yourself, or you have to go run around until you get the information so that you at least can understand where it's going, where the market is going yourself. Right? It will cost a little bit more, but, but it's essential, it's fundamental for a growing company. Who wants to go next? We have time for two more questions, brief ones. Because uh, some of you students have class on this one. And then we go back to Torda. Both former students of AUK, graduates of AUK, one of them works here now, and one of them is starting an enterprise, I guess, something like that. Okay. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to know, that we saw your sister and the director for training and development institute here. I just wanted to know, in regards to I, what kind of preferences does it have for the new ideas and business? Should there, what do you think? You know, is the future, is it on manufacturing, on services, and these students that would like to, to have a business idea? Yes. Uh, what kind does I prefer more? Is it software, maybe companies, or a mix? It's a very good question. We have been dealing with this question for a long time. And see, we are, we are faced with the problem that we are doing it for the first time. We can't estimate exactly the potential of the good ideas. It's very difficult. If we start limiting it to IT or to manufacturing, uh, there is a big risk that we finish up without any good ideas. Although in IT I think that there are. But let's say if we, we insist on manufacturing or, or just agriculture and so on, I'm afraid that we will limit the potential. So, in the first year, we're going to go wide. Whoever, whoever has a good idea, he can compete, right? Be it IT, hardware, industry, agriculture, services, restaurants, good restaurant, but new restaurant, not just any restaurant. If you have a good idea about a restaurant which is unique, which nobody has, and it's a chance to make a chain after that, it's great. Why not? There are cases of restaurant. So we are not limiting the nature. It can be a software company, it can be a business company, a media company, whatever. Then, once we start creating the companies, maybe then we will start um, limiting the areas of, of work. And my preferred areas, which I would love to do, but I don't dare do it now, is Renewables, right? Energy, and second, recycling. These are the two, because I see a lot of potential for recycling and for energy saving and resources saving altogether. And I would, I would limit the whole cycle just to that. But I'm afraid that if we do that, maybe we won't have anybody who will. <laughs> maybe we will. But I can't start <clears throat> and I say, no, no, let's change the, the rules and we will allow everybody. It's not serious. So 
we need to start with the highest likelihood of getting some good ideas. We go to the last question in the back. Go now. Um, uh, my name is Talan Tomobaya. I'm an alumni from the UK, uh, and I've been working for the past three months pretty intensively on my own startup together with two friends, uh, which provides cloud solutions to the German and Swiss speaking space. You provide, excuse me, what do you provide? So called cloud solutions. We do third party support for uh, Google ah, Apps. Okay. Cloud solutions? Yes. Okay. Uh, my first question was where did you live in Switzerland? <laughs> Where? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, my second question is kind of a context, uh, which would be um, during the last three months, or even more essentially, just to the wrap up until we started, um, I've noticed pretty much everything you've been saying, everything from the lack of finance to even the lack of human resources in Kosovo to the lack of uh, proper, educa uh, proper education and specialized education and the lack of entrepreneurial culture here, which fortunately has been starting to change in the last year or so, due to all these investments from all the organizations around in Kosovo. Um, along the way, uh, several startups have come already together in Kosovo and established businesses and even some of the organizations which you've mentioned. And uh, one of the solutions which I personally have proposed was to do a co-working space for the back office work of most of these startups. Uh, because uh, even if you find people in Kosovo which are really good at having a business idea or have identified a really good need and they have the resources to do something, very often they lack the skills or the connections to do the back office things, which are crucial to any kind of business as you know. Uh, so, I mean, as in my case, just by doing my startup, we already got an idea for another company, which, I mean, I'd like to discuss afterwards. So, the question which I want to ask after this would be, how crucial do you think is actually the, I mean, the difference between the idea of the company and the innovation behind it, and actually the execution of the idea? Meaning, um, uh, should there be a difference between the, uh, the guy with the idea and the guy executing it? Like the big companies, I don't know, Apple, yes. where uh, Bosniak had the idea and Steve Jobs just executed it, or is that even possible in Brazil? Well, well, that's that's what happened at New Wave with me and my partner. I mean, I I, I was the one that investigated the market, made the technical spec of the new product of the new technology, and then I asked him if he could design it, and he said yes, and that's how we started, right? So we said that the management team, the, the founders, and you with your friends, you have to complement each other. You have to. You can't be all designers, you need to have a salesman, you need, you need to have somebody to do marketing, you need to do something to do the back office, uh, maybe an application or you know, whatever. So that is that is the work of the management. You have to be able to manage. You have to, a manager sees what's going to happen in five years, and then he can go back to today and then see all the steps that you need to do. Of course things will change in those five years, but not 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 to the opposed direction. You will have to correct it all the time. Now, I will give you an example just to tell you that, I mean, there are many hurdles always in Kosovo here, you will have more hurdles than you have in Switzerland. By the way, I lived in Lugano. Okay. Um, I've just invested in a company, a so called TechFuse. It's an American Kosovo, if you want to, uh, investment. It's a, it's a person from America. And they did Munyako from, from Kosovo. They so they uh, have uh, established TechFuse, a company that designs and manufactures embedded control systems. This is fully new in, in Kosovo, something completely new. And I was so fascinated with the idea, I immediately thought that this is something that is important. Now the, the, uh, another good thing about the whole thing is that Glenn Noble, when he came here, he was uh, he established an NGO of his own because he saw the lack of lack of designers, R&D engineers in Kosovo. So what he did is he, he he established his own NGO, Genesis. He trained 14 new electrical engineers from the university, and he trained them for five months or six months to become R&D engineers. 15 of them. 
and he said I could bring these guys anywhere in, in the States and they will work in any company in America as R&D engineers from here. What happened with those 15 engineers once they were launched? They went to look for a job in Kosovo here as R&D engineers and they ended up being waiters in restaurants. See? So what did Glenn Lobo do? So he sold everything he had in America and came to Kosovo with his family. And he established together with Eddie Techfuse. And he engaged all those engineers. And he started this company. So you see, there are ways of overcoming the problems. Tough, but you have to be creative. Here in Kosovo, you have to be much more creative than in Slovenia or in Switzerland. Right? And this goes also for the back office, for any problem that you have with, with engaging people, the right people. But you have to fight for it, you have to search, you have to create people. And now Genesis is continuing. Now we are working, we're trying to engage the Norwegian government to help us for the Genesis, to finance Genesis, because I don't want to finance it as a private. I want, I want to finance those things that the Norwegian government won't finance, like being a business angel, right? But I don't want to do everything. So. The Norwegian government ambassador, when he saw that, and when he heard about that, he was so fascinated that he is ready to talk with us, right? So we hope that with that, we will generate R&D engineers, not only in electronics, but maybe in software, and maybe in, uh, in mechanics, and maybe in other industries, right? So we have to be creative. We have to communicate with each other, like you are communicating with another company, you learn something, you have to communicate with them. And I'm teaming up companies now, I'm trying to find networks in my own network, you see. I have nothing to do with, uh, you know, with a big company, so I'm trying to create networks, connecting people, connecting companies, and so on, until we create an industry. Once we have an industry, we will become powerful. We can do then all the maintenance in Kosovo without paying huge amounts of money for maintenance, from Germany, Italy, France, and so on. Just that. It's a huge amount of money that goes out because we're not capable of maintaining our own machines. Can't happen. So we have to start from zero. Train the engineers, make them understand how it works, and then let them do it. So that's fun also, finding new solutions. Well, please join me thanking Mr. Gia for this.